PPP Forgiveness Walkthrough SBA Form 3508 Here is a quick disclaimer. So we're going to go through the basic concepts which is part of the SBA Form 34508 and we would need to understand those concepts before we look at the application and then later on let's review the application itself. So how much will be forgiven? So it could be 100% if at least 75% of the loan received was used for payroll purposes and not more than 25% used for non-payroll purposes. Now, some of the concepts we need to understand is covered period or alternative payroll covered period. So for the 75% uh, payroll expenses, we will be looking at a particular period, which is eight weeks, 56 days and it could be referenced as the cover period or alternative payroll covered period so there's a slight difference between these two we'll take a look at it full-time equivalent employees so did you maintain the same number of employees during the covered period did you also maintain the same salary or was there a reduction in the salary? So there cannot be uh, more than 25% reduction in the salary. There cannot be um, a reduction in the full-time employees. And if there were, then to that extent, the forgiveness will be reduced. Now, as far as the non-payroll costs, we will look at the covered period. As you could see, there is no alternative covered period for non-payroll expenses. So the expenses for non-payroll costs are mortgage interest, rent or lease, utilities. So these are the items which is part of the non-payroll expenses which can be covered as forgiven. And it cannot exceed 25% of the total loan amount. So the application involves about 11 pages. And there's a main application. There is Schedule A schedule a worksheet so there's some calculations required in the schedule a worksheet and it has got table one and table two and the worksheet is part of the schedule a in the sense in order to complete schedule a you need to complete the worksheet and in order to complete the main application you need to complete schedule a so to totally 11 pages and we would go through those uh, pages quickly so here's a PPP loan application and this has to be submitted to your lender after completion. The application has uh, these components, PPP loan forgiveness calculation form, Schedule A, and there is a worksheet to Schedule A. And of course, there's an optional demographic information sheet as well. So this is the first page, page one of 11, and does explain some of the terms like, you know, the business, what is the business legal name, address, your loan number, lender number, lender PPP loan number, and employees at the time of application, employees at the time of forgiveness. What is the PPP loan disbursement date? When did you receive it? EIDL loan advance amount. So this is the economic injury disaster loan so this amount is going to be reduced from your payroll forgiveness so you cannot be getting both you cannot get EIDL as well as payroll forgiveness payroll schedule you understand that covered period and alternative covered period so the covered period is 56 days from the day you received the loan the first day the covered period is from the day you received the loan Alternative pay period can be used for employers who use bi-weekly or a more frequent, when a more frequent could be a weekly payroll employers. So these are the employers who can consider using alternative payroll covered period. Others, if it is a monthly payroll employer, they have to go with the covered period. So covered period is the 56 days from the date you received the loan. Alternative payroll covered period is or begins on the first day of their first pay period following their PPP loan disbursement. 
So after you receive the loan, the very first day of the next pay period would be considered as the alternate you payroll covered period. And yes, it still considers the 56 days from that point on. So there's an example here. You could read that. If borrower received loan in excess of $2 million. So if the affiliate companies together, if you have if you have a company and a parent company, subsidiary company, whatever the case may be, if the affiliate companies together received more than two million, then yes, there is this has to be identified in the application. Uh, probably there could be additional scrutiny into the uh, forgiveness application. Page two basically is the line by line explanation for the application, the main form. And the important aspect here is what is eligible payroll costs and what is eligible non-payroll costs. So we have seen this non-payroll costs are mortgage obligations, rent and utilities. Payroll costs are the payroll cost paid during the 56 days period. You could use the covered or alternative payroll covered period. One of the important aspects here is that you cannot take more than $100,000 per employee. Of course, you have been familiar with this when with the application of the loan itself, you would not be able to do more than $100,000. So the forgiveness also cannot exceed the 100000 annual salary per employee uh, calculation. So this is the main loan application. So as we saw, there's all these basic information which is required. Okay, employees at the time of loan application, employees at the time of forgiveness, the ideal loan advance and the application number. What is your payroll schedule weekly, bi-weekly? And the covered period, the alternative covered period. So covered period is, as I said, 56 days from the date you received the loan. Alternative period can be used only by bi-weekly or, uh, you know, lesser frequent than bi-weekly employers. So if you're using an alternative payroll covered period, then you're supposed to be entering it here. If borrower received PPP loans in excess of 2 million, check here. Okay, so the next 11 lines is pretty much what we need to calculate the forgiveness amount. So as I said, this application has Schedule A as well as a worksheet to Schedule A, right? So this information has to come from Schedule A. In a separate session, we are going to look at how exactly these calculations would work, how, how to calculate. So this is page four of 11, and this is mostly certifications on behalf of the borrower. So you would go ahead and say, uh, was used for the loan received, was used for payroll purposes, does not include non-payroll costs in excess of 25%, and owner, employee, our general partner did not receive more than 15385 per individual. This is basically if you're taking at $100,000 annual, and if you were to be taking it for eight weeks, then that's going to be 15385 Again, some certifications here about uh, civil or criminal fraud charges. I've submitted to the lender the required loan documentation, verifying the payroll. Those are the documentation, of course, in a later uh, uh, page, we will look at what are the documentations required. The information provided in the application and the information provided in all supporting documentation and forms are true and correct. The tax documents, what you're going to submit with IRS is going to be in sync with the PPP, uh, SBA forms or application uh, which is referenced here. I understand, acknowledge, and agree the SBA may request additional documentation if necessary. And then you sign off here as a borrower, your name, date, and title. So the next page here is instruction to PPP Schedule A. All right. 
So some of the items in Schedule A comes from Schedule A worksheet. All right. So we are looking at the instruction, line by line instruction for Schedule A. And this is, of course, Schedule A. All right. So as you could see, some of the instruction information is coming from Schedule A worksheet. Cash compensation, average full time employees. We're going to go back to this, um, you know, sheet again after we uh, do the basics. So this is instruction for PPP Schedule A worksheet. So in order to fill the worksheet, you would need to go through this instruction. Now, cash compensation. So this is basically the gross salary, wages, commissions, vacation, salary, sick leave. Um, pretty much everything is in there as well as any severance package allowances for dismissal or separation paid or incurred during the covered period or alternative covered period so for each employee you cannot take more than 15385 which is basically at the $100,000 annual rate next we need to look at average full time employee so for every 40 hours work per week we, we can consider them as a full-time employee. So this calculates the average full-time equivalency during the covered period, alternative covered period. For each employee, enter the average number of hours paid per week, divide by 40, and therefore you could come up with, let's say one, if they have worked for 40 hours. And you have to cap it at one, in the sense if somebody has worked for 50 hours, you cannot say one point, whatever. You would just cap it at one. So that's one full-time equivalent employee. You could also take a simplified method, which is basically for every employee who has worked 40 hours, you could consider as one. Um, and employees who have worked uh, less than 40 hours, you could take as half employee or 0.5. Now the borrower is exempt from such reduction if the FTE's reduction safe harbor applies. So we're gonna look at what the safe harbor for FTE reduction means. Next, we need to look at salary early wage reduction. So basically, they do not want any employees to receive less than 75% of what they used to get before. So if you were to be looking at the average annual salary, what they used to get during this period, January 1st to March 31st, that's the reference period for salary reduction. And during the covered period of the eight weeks, when you pay them for the forgiveness, that's a forgiveness period. During that period, did you at least pay them 75% or more in the salary as they used to get during the period January 1st, 2020 to March 31st, 2020? There is again a safe harbor for the salary reduction as well. So what does a safe harbor salary reduction mean? So if the employee wages paid as of june 30th was the same as the salary what they used to get for a reference period so the reference period here we're talking about is the annual salary or hourly wage they got as of february 15 2020 is the same for the average san annual salary or hourly wages they got for june 30th 2020 So if the annual salary or hourly wage, what they got on June 30th is equal to or more than what they got as of Jan as of February 15, 2020, then the wage uh, or hourly wage reduction safe harbor is met. Okay, so you don't have to take this factor into your calculation. Now, I also said there is an FTE full time employee safe harbor as well. Let's take a look at that. So the borrower is exempt from the reduction in the loan forgiveness based on the FTE factor if both these conditions are met. Number one, the borrower reduced its full-time employee levels in the period beginning February 15, 2020 and ending April 26, 2020. And the borrower then restored its full-time employee levels by no later than June 30th, 2020 its full-time employee levels in the borrower's pay period, that 
included February 15, 2020. So basically, as long as you have restored the full-time employee equivalent as on June 30th, likewise, the salary reduction, if there were any reduction, um, when come for, for a period which when it is compared as on June 30th, if it has been restored, then pretty much you are on the safe harbor for both the salary reduction and the, and the full-time employee equivalent uh, reduction as well. So with that, let's look at uh, PPP Schedule A worksheet. So there's like two tables here. Okay, list employees who were employed by the borrower at any point during the covered period or alternative period whose principal place of residence is in the United States. So this is applicable for both table one and table two. You know, they have to the principal place of residence have to be US. And for table one, the additional requirement is and received compensation from borrower at an annualized rate of less than or equal to 100,000 for all pay periods in 2019 or were not employed by the borrower at any point in 2019. So these are all, this would list all the new employees in 2020 and it's also going to list all the employees who were in 2019 whose salary was less than $100,000 per year. All right so that's the cash compensation we didn't see the definition of what a cash compensation is uh, employee name of course um, identifier would be last four of the social cash compensation we did see the concept earlier average fte so we also did see how to calculate the full-time employee right we are looking at 40 hours per week uh, take the total hours they worked uh, for the week divide by 40 and that's like you know equivalent of one and the last column here is a salary or hourly wage reduction so we did see that they should be paid at least 75 percent of the wages paid between january 1st and uh, january 1st 2020 and march 31st uh, 2020 so that's the period in reference and then we are looking at for the covered period so this this is going to be filled in for the covered period or the alternate you uh, payroll covered period so during that period if there were any salary reduction then that has to be entered here so this is per employee we're looking at so each line each row is going to be for an employee so if you need additional rows here you would go ahead and fill in a separate uh, spreadsheet for it now here we're looking at uh, employee name employee identifier uh, cash compensation and average full-time employee so what is different about table two here we're looking at received compensation from borrower at an annualized rate of more than hundred thousand for any pay period in 2020 okay so in order for us to do the FTE reduction safe harbor we did talk about that as long as the a borrower and full-time employee equivalents as of June 30th uh, they are uh, um, exempt uh, you know and they are there's no reduction in the forgiveness based on the FTE safe harbor so in order to do that this is what you do you go ahead and enter the details here and you figure out if they meet the safe harbor requirement now let's talk about the documents what needs to be submitted along with the form okay so sba does say what documents should be submitted and what documents should be kept by the borrower with them okay so with the documents which needs to be submitted we are looking at payroll documents and we are looking at non-payroll documents and within payroll documents then we are saying we also want to see how did we uh, determine the full-time equivalent you know how are we going to prove that during the covered period we had those full-time employees so we could go ahead and provide them uh, the payroll reports here we're looking at uh, making sure that they've been paid during the covered period bank account statements or third-party payroll service provided reports tax forms like the 941s payment receipts cancel checks And again, payroll reports, which can which can basically show the number of employees they had during the covered period. And for the non-payroll documentation, like the mortgage interest, of course, we're looking at 
anything which could prove that, like the copy of the invoices from February 2020, to show that, yes, they had this payment requirement prior to February 15, 2020. So for the non-payroll, um, the requirement is it has to be uh, same or similar items you had before February 15, 2020. You cannot bring in new interest payments, new mortgage interest payments after February 15, 2020. Likewise, lease payments or rents. So these are the documents which need to be kept by the borrower. Like how did you come up with these calculations for Schedule A worksheet table? Documentation supporting the listing of each individual employee in those tables. And the calculation of the $100,000 or less than $100,000. Documentation regarding any employee job offers refusals firings for cause voluntary okay so i did not mention one other thing here so fte reduction could also be for employees not showing up so you made you may you asked the employees to return to work and they did not show up so those employees are exempt from this fte reduction full-time employee reduction so um, any position for which the borrower made a good faith return offer to rehire an employee during the covered period right any employees who during the covered period or alternative period were fired for cause voluntarily resigned voluntarily requested and received a reduction of their hours in all those cases the ft requirement is exempt because it's not the employer's issue employee's problem all right so let's go back to our documentation here and this is page 11 of 11 and we're looking at the some demographic uh, demographic information here which which is optional so if you'd like to provide uh, the race gender ethnicity and all that information we could and this is of course optional so let us quickly summarize this uh, page one is mostly of uh, concepts instruction where you, the important aspect here is the covered period the alternative cover period you need to look at that and these are all the instruction again for each line item for the main application and here we are looking at uh, eligible payroll costs um, and also non-eligible payroll costs that's important here and then we move to the you know main application here and all these are calculated from Schedule A or worksheet to Schedule A. And we bring in all those items here. We're going to have a separate uh, session on how to calculate itself. You know, we will come up with a, we'll work that on a spreadsheet so I understand better. And then here you have all the certifications or representations you're making. You are basically signing off on all these items. And this is um, signed by the borrower here, the designation name. And then we're looking at Schedule A instruction. We looked at uh, the Schedule A itself. Of course, we did not go in depth as to line by line, which we would in a separate session. And this is a schedule a worksheet instruction we looked at what is cash compensation we looked at what is average full-time employee what is salary wage reduction and what is a safe harbor exemption for salary hardly wage we also looked at um, we looked at this full-time employee um, safe harbor the full-time employee uh, exemption and we looked at uh, what is the exceptions for the reduction in full-time employees like you know we're fired for cause voluntary resignation and this is the schedule a worksheet itself we did take a look at that we also looked at what documentation is required what documentation needs to be submitted for both payroll and non-payroll forgiveness And this is the last page about the demographic information. That's all in this session.